Season four of Rick and Morty is finally here. Well, I mean, half of it is at the time of this recording. It's been a while since we've joined Rick and Morty on their adventures, so to get you caught up, we're giving you the closest thing we can manage to interdimensional cable. Look, with 107 facts about Rick and Morty season four. Now I'm hooked. Number one. The season's not even over yet, but you can expect a lot more of that Richard and Mortimer down the line. Dan Harmon left his own production company, Starburns Industries, just to focus all of his efforts on Rick and Morty for the next few years. Number two. If you can believe it, Adult Swim didn't immediately renew the series when they could. It's all because of heated contract negotiations between the showrunners, Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland, and Adult Swim's parent company, Turner Broadcasting. Ha! Idiots. Number three. See, Roiland and Harmon wanted immortality, which is a pretty rad term, but at the same time, Time, not nearly as cool as it sounds in this context. Basically, they wanted a guarantee that they'd have enough seasons and enough funds to give Rick and Morty their full attention. Neither wanted to feel pressured to take side jobs. Number four. Both Harmon and Roylan want to throw themselves at Rick and Morty because they obviously love making the show. Harmon describes it as an infinite sandbox, the perfect show. Number five. The first episode of season three famously premiered completely unannounced on April Fool's Day 2017. That was already three years ago. In 2018, Adult Swim followed up with Bush World Adventures, a very, very strange 10 minute short inspired by the show that was written and directed by prominent YouTube animator Michael Cusack. Number six, Roiland was a fan of Cusack's works, like the shorts YOLO and the Demo and Darren series, and reached out to him personally about the short. He told them that he could do whatever he wanted. Number seven, shortly after that, we got the news that everybody wanted. On May 10th of 2018, Rick and Morty was renewed for a staggering 70 episodes. For a show that's only had 31 episodes so far, that's unreal. That's basically an eternity in TV time. And based on Rick and Morty's release schedule, that uh, that actually could be enough episodes to take us to the heat death of the universe. Number eight. Finally, in May of 2019, Rick and Morty themselves surprised everyone with an announcement that season four was legitimately coming in November of that year. Number nine. When it comes to writing, it just so happens that Royland and Harmon are excellent counterbalances for one another. Royland describes himself as a free associating idea man, if you can believe that, while Harmon is a notorious perfectionist. Number 10. Dan Harmon writes according to what he calls a story circle, which is essentially a simplified version of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. In Harmon's circle, the character starts in a zone of comfort, but then wants something and enters an unfamiliar situation, which they adapt to. They get what they wanted, but they pay a heavy price for it. Then they return to their initial situation, having changed. Number 11. Harmon also tends to start the path over and over again, meaning he'll attack the first scene until he finds it perfect. Number 12. However, Harmon said that by the end of season three, he could finally objectively measure the amount of early perfectionism that actually makes it into the final cut. Turns out it's uh, way less than he initially thought. Number 13. Royland admits that the show takes so long to make because everyone on board is compelled to fix anything that might be lagging in an episode. Even when an episode comes back in good shape, the crew will still cut and add things to elevate the episode. Number 14. With all that perfectionism, it's no surprise that the Rick and Morty crew isn't blinded by hubris. They can tell perfectly well when a certain episode is the weakest point of a season, and they do everything they can to help it along. Number 15. While there's certainly a lot of difference between the two, there's a lot of Harmon in Rick's character. Around season two, Roiland even started accidentally calling him Rick. Though knowing Justin Roiland, which I don't, I doubt he was doing it by accident. Number 16. Harmon breaks down the message of Rick and Morty as, you're gonna be tempted to believe that being human is important and that is going to cause you to suffer. Uplifting, just as we expected. Number 17. Roiland's favorite aspect of the show is exploring all the different planets that Rick and Morty travel to and making unique crazy aliens for each one. He and Harmon joke that once they run out of planet names, the show is gonna end. Number 18. While the idea of revisiting planets and certain characters isn't banned, the Rick and Morty team prefers to invent new places and keep pushing forward. They worry that bringing back old favorites would just come across as disingenuous fan service. Number 19. Naturally, Rick and Morty's relationship is starting to evolve, or maybe devolve is more fitting. Harmon and Royland acknowledge that season four is the point where Morty starts pushing back a little more and becomes more disobedient because he's seen all these sides of Rick. Number 20. With a 70 episode order to fill, don't expect this ramp up to continue to the extreme. Harmon says this won't be a linear thing where Morty kills Rick in his sleep and ends the show or anything like that. Number 21. In fact, Harmon and Royland view the show as Simpsons-esque, meaning they don't plan on having the characters really age. Number 22. You can still look forward to some serialized content in the show, though. Harmon characterized season four as having serialized stuff we check in on now and then that's sprinkled over the top of strong episodic episodes. That seems true for the series as a whole as well. Number 23. Still, the pair certainly doesn't expect to run out of steam. Harmon comments that they've always written Rick and Morty 
as if there would be a thousand episodes. Number 24. Fans were initially a little disappointed, as they tend to be, but season four was revealed to have just 10 episodes. Harmon and Royland see the show continuing with the previously established 10 episode season format. Number 25. Rick and Morty merchandising started getting out of control after the show exploded following season three. Royland and Harmon were even approached about a Rick and Morty perfume, which was never actually made, thank God. I can only imagine what that would have smelled like. Belches? Space? A plumbus? Number 26. In December of 2019, Pringles announced that they would be releasing Pickle Rick flavored chips. Not pickle flavored, Pickle Rick flavored. Think about that for a second. Number 27. Also in November of 2019, Adult Swim teamed up with car rental group Apturo to bring you the Morty Mobile, an actual car you can actually rent as it tours around the country that has a giant screaming Morty on top of it. Okay? Number 28. If you decide to shell out the cash for the Morty Mobile, the proceeds go to a charity advancing women in technical fields. Okay, it's less weird now that I know that it's going to a good cause. Number 29. In the very first scene of season four, the writers wanted to be sure to demonstrate that the power dynamic of the Smith family had shifted, namely that Beth was now the head of the household, which of course puts a sudden limiter on Rick. Number 30. If Edge of Timorty, Rick Die, Rick Pete made you doubt it, Harmon affirms that Rick can in fact die, just not by conventional means. Like vampire and werewolves, there are methods one could use to kill Rick, but of course, that's a secret Harmon's keeping close to the chest. Number 31. Morty's plotline in the episode was written to be a metaphor for a rather deep existential dilemma. If you're playing it safe your entire life, are you ever actually living? But in a true, seemingly paradoxical Rick and Morty fashion, that's what causes him to mess around with crazy sci-fi weapons in Rick's garage. Number 32. Morty's subplot eventually becomes an Akira-type situation, and a news ticker even refers to him as Akira Boy. Both are referencing Kazuhiro Otomo's classic 1988 anime masterpiece, Akira. Number 33. The Akira references go way deeper than just a few name drops, though. Both Morty and Akira's central troubled teen Tetsuo, or TETSUO, if you'd like, develop crazy powers that they use to overwhelm the military. And yes, to those unfamiliar, that means that just like with Link and Zelda, the name of the character Mori's mirroring is not in fact named Akira. It's, it's a common mistake, Jerry. Number 34. Plus that end scene where Morty morphs into that horrifying tree thing is definitely and not to Akira's notable climax. Number 35. However, the title of the episode actually comes from the 2014 sci-fi film Edge of Tomorrow, Live, Die, Repeat, which was in turn based on the light novel All You Need Is Kill by Hiroshi Sakurazaka. Number 36. Of course, Rick and Morty is also famous for having ridiculous guest star cameos. In Edge of Tomorrow, Rick, Die, Rick, Pete, comedian actress Sherry Shepard played the judge that Morty wins over with his talk of Peru. You might recognize Shepard from 30 Rock, How I Met Your Mother, or maybe you just like the penguin in The Masked Singer. Number 37. Shepard actually double dipped for the season. She also made a cameo as Tony's wife in episode two, The Old Man in the Seat, which yes, means she's the one saying, come poop with me. Number 38, Tony the Toilet Stealer was played by Jeffrey Wright, who you may best recognize as Bernard from HBO's Westworld. Number 39, the entire plot of that episode came from further wanting to explore Rick's isolation, starting with a phenomenon that isn't all that uncommon, being a shy pooper. Number 40. The team all thinks of Tony as a genuinely good person. His attempt to reach out to Rick in friendship and Rick's rejection were crafted to turn the story into one about Rick's capacity for friendship. Number 41. Come to think of it, that was a super celebrity-packed episode. There was also Rick's intern, Gloody, who was played by Taika Waititi, the Oscar-winning writer, director, actor known for films like What We Do in the Shadows, Thor Ragnarok, and Jojo Rabbit. Number 42. Gloody's boss, the Monogatron leader, is played by Sam Neill, who played Dr. Alan Grant in Jurassic Park. A bit of a shame they didn't get him for Anatomy Park, but better late than never. Number 43. The Monogatron Queen is played by Kathleen Turner. She's taken the lead in classics like Romancing the Stone, but she's also the semi-uncredited voice of Jessica Rabbit. Number 44. In one crew over the Ku Cruise Morty, Rick's disdain for the heist genre is on full display. That's one of Rick's qualities that is 100% based on Dan Harmon. In fact, Harmon encouraged Royland to watch some heist movies just to point out how ridiculous they were, and Royland ended up totally agreeing. Number 45. However, However, you may be relieved to know that the episode's writer, Katie Delany, actually does enjoy heist movies, so it wasn't entirely bred of cynicism. Number 46. And yes, that was actually Elon Musk providing the voice for his tusked cartoon counterpart, Elon Tusk. Number 47. Elon Musk has long been a huge fan of the show. He even engaged with the Rick and Morty Twitter account after the season three finale to compliment the episode and talk about singularities. Harmon quickly added that Musk was welcome on the show anytime. Number 48. Musk changed his Twitter name to Elon Tusk back in February of 20. 
2019. Considering his episode didn't premiere until November, you'd think that we would be confused by Elon Musk's Twitter decisions, but he's made far weirder Twitter posts, so this actually seemed kind of normal for him. Number 49. Everything's chummy with Elon Tusk, but Rick and Morty have a famously bizarre relationship with Kanye West. It all started in May 2018 when Kanye tweeted that Rick and Morty was his favorite show and he'd seen every episode at least five times. Number 50. Things escalated when in June of 2018, Royland recruited his friends Chaos Chaos to record a very, very strange and wonderful birthday song for Kanye featuring Rick doing things to Kanye in his sleep. Number 51. The ultimate unexpected turn came when Harmon and Royland not just offered Kanye a guest appearance, but his own episode. Nothing's come of the offer yet due to scheduling, but both parties are serious about collaborating. Number 52. Daniel Radcliffe also has an open invitation to come on the show, do a voice, and just hang out in the writer's room. Apparently, he's also a huge fan. Whatever. Anyway, back to people who have actually appeared on the show. Number 53. The talking cat from Claw and Hoarder Special Rictims Unit was voiced by Matthew Broderick. Broderick finally returns to felines after voicing Simba in the OG Lion King. A adult Simba, not not child Simba, but he's been in a ton of stuff. Ferris Bueller, the producers, you know. Number 54. According to Harmon, the cat represents the voice in the writer's room who says, you're overthinking it, just have fun. They took a cue from Disney films like Oliver and Company where no one ever bothers to explain why the animals can talk. Number 55. Obviously, Morty's dragon, Balthrama, had to be voiced by somebody from Game of Thrones, so they got Liam Cunningham, better known as Sir Davos Seaworth. Number 56. There will be more celebrity guests in the second half of season four, but we'll just have to guess about who they are. The first half of season four finished just before the holidays, promising that the rest would return in 2020. Nice and precise return date, as usual. Number 57. We do know that somewhere in these next five episodes, we finally get Paul Giamatti. That's all we got. Number 58. Anthony Chun, the director of Claw and Horror, points out that eroticism, in a way, is the path to defeat the patriarch, at least in the episode. But also, maybe not just in the episode, in their view. Number 59. We mentioned earlier that the Rick and Morty crew can spot the worst episode, which means they also have their favorites. Rattlestar Rick Lactica was Royland's favorite, at least of the first five of season four. Number 60. Royland and Harmon have said multiple times that despite Rick having a box labeled time travel stuff, they wouldn't do a time travel episode. Obviously, they caved for Rattlestar Rick Lactica, but... But, like... Did they? Number 61. Actually, the idea behind the episode had been around since season three, but they had trouble cracking the episode back then. But it was always going to start with getting a flat tire in space and a snake in an astronaut suit. Number 62. The team was able to flesh the premise out into a full episode once they gave it a time travel Terminator twist. They figured that diving into a society of snakes was also pretty dumb, so why not also give it the dumbest possible plot device? Time travel. Number 63. As Morty's dying of snake venom, Rick jokes that he looks like a 90s Japanese ghost. That's a callback to horror films like The Ring, the original one, Ringu, or The Grudge, the original one, Juan, which came out in 1998 and 2002 respectively, but whatever. Morty's not quite that pale, but we understood that reference. Number 64. In 1985, in Snake World, there's a poster for the snake version of Back to the Future. Not only is that a fun reference to make during a time travel episode, but if you recall, Rick and Morty began life as Doc and Marty, a spoof on Back to the Future. Number 65. Although the episode was largely filled with hissing snakes, Keegan-Michael Key returned on Rattlestar Rick Lactica to reprise his role as the time cop Schleamy Pants. Number 66. Perhaps not surprisingly, the voice actors of the show don't record together, it's just one at a time, and usually Royland and the writer of the episode will be present to direct. Royland is also obviously there when he's recording his own lines. Number 67. When voicing Summer, Spencer Grammer based her character off a particularly badass accomplished friend of hers. Summer's a not yet successful teenager, so Grammer imagined her friend was nerdy and was still trying to find herself as a woman. Number 68. Grammer says that Summer's character in a script will change a little bit after a Dan Harmon pass. Namely, she'll get more intention behind what she does. Number 69. The 2019 Adult Swim Festival featured an exclusive advanced screening of the season 4 premiere, which at the time was a pretty big deal. It was obviously highly anticipated. Number 70. Meanwhile, Royland has a ton of things happening outside of Rick and Morty. He's teaming up with the executive producers of Robot Chicken for a short short-form claymation show called Gloop World, which will be available on the streaming service Quibi. Number 71. Gloop World isn't some spur-of-the-moment idea either. It's a show that Royland has been trying to make for seven years. He describes it as a tactile clay animation show with a mysterious, weird, and expansive world and really fun characters, fingerprints and all. Number 72. Additionally, Royland and Rick and Morty writer-producer Mike McMahon have a two-season contract with Hulu for a comedy about an alien family moving to Earth called Solar Opposites. The first season will premiere on May 8th of this 
this year by the latest reports. Number 73. By the way, McMahon is also working on helming an animated Star Trek series for CBS All Access called Star Trek Lower Decks. It's a perfect fit for him. McMahon's cat is named after the Star Trek character Riker, and his son is named Sagan after Carl Sagan, of course. Number 74. Royland and his video game company, Squanch Games, have also made use of the time between seasons. On February 6th of 2018, they released Accounting, a virtual reality game about, uh, being an accountant. And nothing else. Nope, no additional content or deep rabbit holes or easter eggs to dive down here whatsoever. Number 75. Only five months after the release of Accounting, Squanch Games released yet another VR game, Dr. Splorchy Presents Space Heroes. It's a simpler mobile experience that went on sale for just five dollars. Number 76. Squanch Games returned to high-end VR in 2019 with their biggest release yet, the full-length game Trover Saves the Universe. The game has been described as an extended Rick and Morty episode with new characters, so if you're watching this video, you'll probably like it. Number 77. Unlike the other games, Trover Saves the Universe is additionally available in a non-VR format. You can even get it for the Nintendo Switch. Number 78. Harmon and Royland have assured fans that long waits are a thing of the past. In other words, the gap between seasons three and four will be the longest gap between Rick and Morty seasons ever. I say incredibly skeptically. Number 79. Unfortunately, a number of fans didn't take to that wait so well. Both Royland and Harmon, especially Harmon, were harassed on Twitter by impatient, angry fans. To, like, an extremely not okay extent. Number 80. The fan base for Rick and Morty grew significantly during season 3. By the end of it, Rick and Morty was the most popular TV comedy among millennials, period. Number 81. But before the renewal, fans got the spotlight in news stories across the country. On October 7th of 2020, 2017, McDonald's did a special one-day release of the Szechuan sauce Rick famously pined for in the season 3 premiere. Number 82. It was a fun idea, but the release didn't go as planned. McDonald's dramatically underestimated the demand for the Szechuan sauce, and locations quickly ran out. Or never got any at all, cries in Canada. Number 83. The result was chaos and anger. At one McDonald's, a thousand fans camped out for what turned out to be 70 sauces. The crowd began angrily chanting, we want sauce. In another location, a guy stood on the counter and screamed at the fry cooks. I'm sure you've seen the video by now. There were basically riots. Number 84. Some people were able to make a quick buck off the whole situation, though. The next day, packets of Szechuan sauce appeared on eBay, running between 60 and 1,000 bucks. Number 85. One leftover packet of Szechuan sauce from 1998 was being bid on for upwards of $99,000 in early 2017. Number 86. Anyway, the response was so intense that McDonald's promised to release the sauce again and for a longer time the following winter. They had 20 million packets in tow the next time, so no riots, and there was much rejoicing. Number 87. The vocal part of the fan base took up a new cause after the Szechuan sauce debacle, harassing season 3's two new female writers online and blaming them for what they felt was a decline in Rick and Morty's quality. And yet, uh, Jessica Gao wrote Pickle Rick, so... Number 88. Harmon and Royland both, of course, denounced this kind of behavior. Harmon was additionally concerned that once the title of your show becomes a way of describing a demographic, that is toxic. But to be fair, you have to have a very high IQ to understand Rick and Morty, as has been mentioned in the comments of the many Rick and Morty cartoon conspiracies we've done. Number 89. In fact, the fascist Morty who demands at gunpoint that he and Rick go on classic adventures free of politics in the season 4 premiere is in all likelihood a not-so-subtle dig to this contingent of Rick and Morty's fan base. Number 90. Thankfully, Rick and Morty has more going for it than just fan drama. Notably, the show released a soundtrack through Sub Pop Records on September 28th, 2018. Number 91. In addition to classics by the show's composer, Ryan Elder, the soundtrack includes songs from the show by Chaos Chaos, Blonde Redhead, Mazzy Star, and more. There are also new songs by Clipping and Chad Van Galen. Number 92. Mega fans can also buy a deluxe vinyl set, which includes a fancy green colored vinyl, as well as a poster, patch, sticker, bonus single, and cassette. All you're missing is like an 8-track to round out the obsolete media cornucopia. Number 93. One of the most infamous songs on the soundtrack is the Royal and Chaos Chaos collaboration Terry Folds. When it was initially released in September of 2017, it charted on the Billboard Top Rock songs at number 33. Number 94. Getting on Rick and Morty also caused a huge spike for blonde redheads for the damaged coda. You might know it better as that evil Morty song. In fact, when the song re-emerged in the show during season 3, it reached number 15 on Billboard's rock chart 17 
15 years after it was initially released, and I've listened to it on Spotify no less than 4,000 times. Number 95. Bands like Blonde Redhead and Mazzy Star show up in Rick and Morty by Harmon and Royland's personal requests. They both love 90s shoegaze. Number 96. Elder's main influence for the show's iconic theme song was a mix of a few surprising sci-fi shows. There's Doctor Who, of course, but also Farscape and Invader Zim. And now that I've said that, I can, I can, I can really hear the Invader Zim inspiration. Number 97. Actually, Elder's theme was originally written for Dog World, a completely different Royland show that never made it to air. The song was just a placeholder for Rick and Morty, but the entire team fell in love with it. Number 98. One of the most memorable songs from the show is Goodbye Moon Men, which is sung by Flight of the Concords' Jermaine Clements. The team only had 20 minutes to get Clemens' vocals on the song after he'd recorded all of his lines for Fart, but Clemens' such a pro that Elder just used his first take. Number 99. Elder gets a ton of free agency on Rick and Morty, much more than a composer gets on the average show. Most shows dictate where they want the music to go, but Elder largely gets to make that decision himself. Then he tweaks everything in collaboration with Harmon and Royland after his first pass. Number 100. Since Royland actually has a background as a musician, he tends to be the one who gives more notes to Elder. Royland often wants to experiment with the music, but Harmon is more of a this doesn't work type when it comes to that kind of stuff. Number 101. Both Harmon and Royland make a ton of cameos in the show's music. To attempt to make Harmon's job on the song Fathers and Daughters easier, Elder placed in a few doo-doos as a placeholder backing vocal, but Harmon took the doo-doos very seriously, to the point where the song is now colloquially known as doo-doo butt. Number 102. The centerpiece of the inaugural Adult Swim Festival in 2018 was the Rick and Morty musical Rick Experience. Ryan Elder led a 37-person orchestra to live score the season 3 episode The Rick Shank Redemption. Number 103. This marks the first time that Elder's music for the show was played by a group of actual humans. Composition can be a very solitary process, and when composing the score, Elder brings in a live musician only occasionally to fill in the blanks. Number 104. Elder and tons of other composers typically write with the help of samplers and recordings of real instruments. However, a few songs, like Goodbye Moon Men, were recorded with a live band. Number 105. Several of the songs from the soundtrack were also performed as part of the experience, featuring a few special guests. Rappers Open Mike Eagle and Father fronted a performance of Get Swifty, and Bob's Burgers' John Roberts helped out on Terry Folds. Number 106. Season 4 isn't even done yet, but you're probably asking, what about Season 5? Actually, months before Season 4 even aired, the Rick and Morty team had already begun work on the show's fifth season. And fact number 107, rolling right into the fifth season while the fourth was still wrapping up was a very deliberate move for Royland and Harmon. They want to force themselves to commit to a quicker schedule under the new contract. Though for now, we do still have to wait before we can enjoy the rest of Season 4, but at least we know that Season 5 is coming, and if you can't wait for the next video on Channel Frederator, then make sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon, you know all this stuff. I've been your host, Jacob, thanks for watching, and of course, Frederator loves you.